Anati and Bunolo. Ladies, how are you? We're good. feeling great. What's happening here? Where are you from? Um, we're from Anton Limbede MSc Academy, um, a school located in La Mercy here in Durban near Umzoti and Tongat. So basically we're here on behalf of ESCOM Expo which was a science competition platform for young scientists to actually explore the world and come back with the results of whatever they've found. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Anati to just explain uh, more about it. So, XCOM Expo, XCOM Expo um, it basically is a platform where young scientists get to showcase their ideas through categories that are listed in the book. And if you want to know more about it, you can go and visit and visit their, web, their website. Um, also, XCOM, XCOM Expo for Young Scientists, it opens a lot of doors for different individuals with different ideas. Um, in general, it's just amazing. So I can pass it over to Ubono. When did you win the competition? So um, in ESCOM Expo, we started last year um, where we had an initial idea to power street lights. Um, we went from regional to provincial to national and we were one of the lucky people who were actually chosen to actually present um, South Africa with our um, uh, idea and we ended up coming in first place um, winning gold medals in last year in the International Science Fair. Congratulations. So please explain your model. So in terms of our model, when coming to our model, we have um, we have three ways of actually producing electricity. So in these ways, we are bringing a concept that has never been applied in the world. So it's actually a concept of using solar power, wind power and hydropower, with hydropower basically dominating in the sector. So we actually took into consideration of taking um, solar panels and uh, wind power to actually um, power um, uh, the pump that's going to be used to actually move from the water from an underhead tank which is over here to actually an overhead tank which is over here. So after moving it from an underhead tank to an overhead tank, water will then be um, uh, let, uh, released into this uh, petlon turbine station over here. The water will be released and it will be hitting the spoons over here, making them turn as they are connected to a um, 48 to 12 chain, meaning that per uh, one chain turn over here, we are going to get four over here. Um, as it's connected to a motor, it's actually going to take from kinetic energy and turn it into electrical energy. That electrical energy will be stored in way of uh, two forms, UPS and storage. So in UPS, we are basically talking about uninterrupted power supply, which will be powering industry sectors. And we are talking about battery storage, where we will be storing uh, batteries in case of any um, natural disasters of not either having uh, sunlight or wind to actually power the system, to actually boot the solar panel, to actually boot the solar panel, which is going to take uh, the pump from down here to actually power the underhead tank to provide water to the overhead tank. So basically over here we are going to be using the battery storage to actually pump the underhead tank water up and it's going to keep on uh, rotating um, abundantly. So after the process of water hitting the petlon turbine, it's going to get stored again in the underhead tank and it's going to carry on um, actually powering supply and recycling the water that we are going to be using since we know that South Africa is currently scarce with water. So I'm going to hand on to Anati to explain what's going on in terms of the industry sector. Before you, before you, you hand over, how much electricity 
generation is created by this? How, how many megawatts do you get from this? So currently over here we are having 12 volts in this one here. So the bigger the tanks, um, the more energy and the more megawatts that we can produce. And this is normal water? Yes, normal water since temperature, um, temperature is currently room temperature. Um, so how this is actually going to power um, the industry sectors, this is basically a demonstration of how it's going to power. So as it uses UPS, UPS of which means an, an uninterrupted power supply, um, it's actually going to transfer over to here, powering your stadiums of which are your entertainment sectors, powering your hotels, um, your households and your hospitals just to keep everything running and going in the country to increase also the, econo the economy of the country. and from, from an initial project, it will continue and still power streetlights. How many employees in your plant? So, in terms of um, creating employees, there's going to actually have to be a lot of employees because this can become a, the next big thing since it's going to be having maybe, let's say, more than 100,000 employees or something of that sort since there's a lot that needs to be done over here and we are going to be readdressing a lot of problems like in terms of unemployment, in terms of um, electricity, we are now moving to FIR so we need to actually have the electricity that is actually going to be abundant so that whenever we need to do something we can do it. Whenever we need to do something we can do it in the cleanest form of way to actually make sure that climate change doesn't hit South Africa that uh, deeply. And also, and also um, what our project is aiming and would like to deliver um, on the table in terms of like helping South Africa grow as a country is to decrease the strain that ESCOM has in terms of like power generation, which would also end um, a load shading, the load shading, the load shading that we get these days. Thank you so much, ladies. Fascinating things you're doing here. All the best with your studies. here at uh, Sasta stand to learn what is happening with the exhibition that I'm seeing here. Happy? Yes ma'am. Please explain to me what okay, is happening. Basically here yeah, uh, we are demonstrating the forces that will be acting on this, on this floating pole. Uh, you see in the classroom I mean uh, teachers are always talking about forces, upward forces, gravities and so on. So basically here we are showing the forces. Over here we have a Pinoli blower that is releasing air. So I'm going to show you the forces that are going to act on this pole and this pole will be floating. So right now, as you can see, the pole is floating and this is not magic, it's just pure science. We have the applied force that is acting on this pole, which is coming from the Pinoli blower and from Newton's state law of, action, uh, of motion, it says for every action there is a uh, re reaction like I'm stepping on the floor the floor is stepping on me so when you apply the, this force on this pole you will have another force acting in the opposite directions of the pole and of course we know that another force the famous one which is called uh, force of gravity is acting downwards and again from the, uh, Newton's state law of motion we have an opposite force acting against the gravity which is the normal force in this case because it is going up so if the four forces are balanced this ball will be floating forever unless an external uh, force acts upon it this ball will remain like this what happens when the air comes from the top uh, the only applied force here is the one that is coming from this one so basically there won't be any air coming from the top the only force the only force that is we have one force that is going up and the other one is going down which is the force of gravity so if you can get a disturbance like maybe it's windy that will be your external force and from Newton's first law of motion there, there will be a disturbance in the four forces that are acting on this pole then the pole will fall but if it's like this this pole will fall, will float forever mm. Wow, and then what about this? 
Oh, this is just uh, this is just for kids to show them uh, the, 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 the optics. We are introducing the optics topics to them. So what you see here, what we have here is a real image. You put your hand closer. I don't know whether the camera can capture this. If you put your hand closer, another hand is coming out of this, of this real image. Yes, now I am shaking myself. Yes, this is what is happening here. This is just a demonstration of optics. All right, and we are going to the last exhibition. I see a pedal generator here. What is it used for? Um, this is a pedal for power. Basically, here we are showing the principle of producing power uh, by uh, using um, by cycling this bicycle. So, whatever he is doing here, we are going to choose one of these objects to demonstrate to you how much power does it require. So, as you can see over here, we have the TV, the camera, the fan, incandescent lamps, and LED lamps, and hair dryer. So you will see when my colleague is pedaling there that uh, in some of these objects here, he, 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 it will require more energy and more power for him to have an effect on this object that I've mentioned. So right now we will start and show, demonstrating to you uh, how much power is it, how much work is it required for him to have uh, the television on, which is, yeah, the TV on. So right now, um, we are going to select uh, the TV over here, these knobs. Um, we don't need to to show, uh, to select for now, but we are just going to pedal the bicycle and see how much power is required for him to have this television on. As you can see here, he's not um, putting too much energy to have this uh, TV on. And right now, we are going to change to some of these objects and show you how much power will be required. Um, as they, they, what basically, what is happening here, the more he cycles, the, he is creating and he's creating power that is turning this object on. So at the, at the bottom there, you see that uh, LED lamp, it's, uh, it requires three watts. And that watt is the power that is putting on cycling them. Now we're going to show you how much power it will require for the in incandescent lamp. You can see the incandescent lamp is blinking. That means it requires more power. And now we are going to show you how much power uh, it, it is required to turn this fan on. Uh, switch it on, Sipo. You see, the fan does not require a lot of power because he's not cycling as much as he was before. But since you can see everything is on now, that means a lot of energy is needed for him, from him to produce more power. It just tells you that, I mean, if you switch everything on at home, you will be consuming a lot of energy. Uh, but if you have some of the lights off, you will be saving a lot of energy. And um, you can see down there, we also have a hair dryer. The hair dryer is not turning on. That means the hair dryer, it consumes a lot and lot of energy. Do not stop, I want the hair dryer on. Um, we, are waiting, we are waiting to see whether the hair dryer will be turned on. As you can see, the gentleman who is cycling over there is getting exhausted. Basically, this is the principle shows you that i mean if all the lights at home are on the televisions the heaters you'll be consuming a lot of electricity so basically here we're demonstrating that i mean if you don't need to use the heater you have to switch it off if the tv if you are not watching the tv you have to switch it off because i mean as you, as you see from this demonstration these appliances at homes it takes a lot of energy as you have a lot of shading load shedding because people at home they just switch everything on unnecessarily so this is just showing you the strain uh, that escom is uh, experiencing if you have appliances at home that you are not using we have just learned about the importance of saving electricity at home 
Thank you so much. Happy. I am now visiting Seineps and with me is GP Khaupaleli Sonsuri and Khumuto Madi. Hi guys, Hello. what is happening here? <laughs> uh, today we are here at the National Science Week, right? Um, to actually disseminate information pertaining to nuclear science and technology to the learners to tell them about available careers that are there in the nuclear science and technology, uh, to inform them about the different industries available, different nuclear industries available in the country, and how they are regulatory, how they are regulated and controlled for safe applications. Yes, what we're trying to do is to ensure that South Africans understand that uh, nuclear science and technology is very critical to the economy. Uh, what applications from gener generation of power? We've got a beautiful Quebec nuclear power plant in Cape Town. We've got a research reactor called Safari at Nexa, which is a South African nuclear energy corporation. We've got the Timber Labs in Cape Town, which are producing radioisotopes and doing different types of uh, research and development to ensure that this beautiful country of ours can move forward and compete globally. The role of nuclear in combating climate change. Yes, what is very critical about nuclear is that nuclear is part of the clean energy sources. I mean, if you go to Quebec, it's so clean, it's better than my house. I mean, I can tell you how clean is that. So nuclear power plant is contributing zero uh, in terms of the emissions, so it can be used to combat nuclear uh, climate change to ensure that uh, we can preserve this beautiful environment uh, globally. So. so we believe strongly that nuclear must be part of the uh, just transition. Uh, into cleaner energy and we think it will contribute significantly on the climate change uh, compartment. How long does it take to regulate a nuclear plant? <clears throat> um, well, we cannot actually specify the time frame, right? It's also based on how ready the, 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 the person that is actually applying for the nuclear license, uh, how, how, how long it takes for them to, um, what's the right word, to demonstrate, right? the safety of the facility in terms of the design, in terms of um, protecting the, the nearby communities and how they will be able to control it during the operation of the facility. So we could say around two, three months before the application is processed and obviously it will also be dependent on the, um, on the skills that are there within the regulatory uh, organization to be able to uh, process and review and assess the application from the whole, from the, the applicants actually. All right, the economic impact of nuclear build programs. It's massive, it's massively massive. Because when you start by construction at peak, for just 1,200, you'll need about 15 to 20,000 people on the construction side. So, you know, in South Africa, we, when we create economically, one person takes care of 10 family members. So you can see that, you know what, firstly, the person will have an income, will be able to economically survive uh, their family. Thirdly, they'll contribute to tax. I mean, your tax bracket increases and so forth. So fourthly, your industrialization, because now you have to develop the skills from uh, companies that will participate in the supply value chain of the construction of the nuclear power plant. Not only that, even commissioning and operation, remember every 18 to 24 months, you have to uh, uh, sort of a refuel. And during refueling, there's a lot of maintenance, there's a lot of change of valves, pipes, and so forth. So if you look at Quebec on its own, contribute about 20 billion rent when you look at the economy of Western Cape and the economy of nationally. So if two units, only 900 megawatt can contribute such kind of significant amount. So imagine if you build more nuclear power plant globally, all the developed economy, I'm not gonna repeat this, all the developed economy in the whole world, they have nuclear. They have nuclear, USA, Russia, China, UK, everyone who has nuclear is economically advanced. If you don't advance your nuclear power plant, your economy of scale is not going to be that big. We have seen it with only Quebec. So we need to build more nuclear power plant. Also, we need base load, stable, dispatchable electricity. We have seen load shading has affected our economy drastically so. I mean, we've seen stage six. Stage six, apparently, you lose about eight billion. 
per day in the econ on the economy. So it is important that we have base load electricity in order to fuel your economy, to power the people, to have reliable and secure supply of electricity. And of course, you need the skills. Remember, nuclear is the finest of the finest. When you get to the nuclear industry, you have people from PhDs and so forth because that's where you develop high-tech skills, you know, and those people can be go anywhere. UAE is taking our people, Egypt is building, we're going to lose the skills to all these countries that are building. So, you know, when you are nuclear developed, you can fit anywhere. How many employees at Quebec power plant right now? We've got about 1,850 employees at Quebec. We've got almost 2,000 at Nexa. So it gives you the 4,000 with the small nuclear uh, community that we have. So it clearly shows that nuclear, when you talk about the, what do you call it, the parking lot phenomenon, you know, I like to explain that. Nuclear has the highest, has the biggest parking lot than any other energy source. So that tells you who makes the most jobs? Nuclear. Thank you so much. I'm here at stand number 28. With me right here, right now, is Ubusi Unati Nosbo. Please tell me what's happening here. Okay, guys. Uh, I think I need to reintroduce myself. I'm Busisi Wetanga. I'm from Chemistry Petsamaritzbeck Campus, UKZN Petsamaritzbeck Campus in the School of Chemistry and Physics under the research of Prof. Fanny Van Yerden. Yes. In our research, we are based in traditional medicine, indigenous knowledge, if we may call it. So basically what we do, we are trying to make a collaboration between science and traditional healers to protect our indigenous knowledge and also to pass it on to the next generation. So what we do, since we are scientists, we go to the traditional healers, of which is something that we, we did not use or do before. Before we were based on literature, our research was literature based. Now we go to traditional healers, we talk to them, we ask them about different plants as you can see from the pictures over there. We were there with traditional healers in the market. They tell us, okay, that's okay. This particular plant we use for this particular disease, this particular plant we use for this particular disease, this particular plant we use for this particular disease. Like they say for in uh, instance, here we have Impepone. Impepo we know it's uh, it connects us to the underground and gang, sisters. yeah. But there's more into it than just connecting us to the underground gang. Yes, it also repels the insects and also used for cold and flu. That is interesting to us as scientists. What we need to do once the traditional healer tells us that we need to verify it, so that we can go back to community and educate people about the traditional medicine, of which is very accessible to them. And here we have untuhumbili. Untuhumbili. People were using it during COVID-19, mixing it with a intungunyembe. Untugumbil, it heals you in two days. That's why it's called untugumbil, two days. Yeah. If you're mixing it as fresh leaves and then stem with it, it relieves everything in your chest. And that has been verified. It's been verified. Many people have been using it. So now in the lab, do you work with specific labs? Oh, uh, we are in the research lab. We have the labs at UKZN. Okay. Yeah. So we have collaboration from different departments, biochemistry, where they do analysis for us. We are chemistry-based. What we do, I think Sponelo can explain more in chemistry. Yeah. So as my colleague has mentioned, that we ask the practitioners uh, for the plant use of the plants. So after we've verified uh, the activities of the plant, but the plant is used traditionally, we then take the plant to the lab to get those uh, single constituents that are responsible for the type of activity. For example, I'm dealing with succulent plants, which are under a family called euphobia. So they are poisonous plants, um, but although they have poisonous compounds, some compounds have been proven to have very powerful uh, uh, biological activities. There's one drug at the moment which is used for cancer, for treating uh, skin cancer, called actinic keratosis. So one of the compounds that I solicited on that toxic extract was a, a, a compound called the football ester. Yeah. So in, um, in, the, in the continuation of that research, we research uh, euphobias of South Africa to see which compounds are there that can be used for different 
kinds of activities. So we then take the plant, we extract the compounds, we get their structures. Uh, it's a long process. It involves different kinds of, uh, of procedures and all those things. But at the end, we get the full uh, profile of the compound and then we test it and see if it has activity against that illness or not. And then we can publish that, those results and then we can uh, collaborate with other departments to formulate uh, uh, clinical trials in order for us to create a certain drug. Yeah. All right, so I'm interested in one plant that I'm not seeing here, the marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is. <laughs> Why did you not bring it? Um, uh, our supervisor doesn't allow us to work with marijuana. I don't know why. <laughs> but you have it in the lab? Uh, in the lab, no, we don't have it if at the moment. Have... Yeah, she doesn't allow us to work with it as students. I think it's because we are students. But in industry, there are so many biological activities that are associated with marijuana. Me personally, after finishing my PhD, I would like to work with it. Yeah. Can I have this? If I... <laughs> no, yes, we can, of course. Of course. Later and on. What, also what we are trying... No, I, I understand this very well. Yeah, <laughs> according yeah. to marijuana, my ancestors is... are study. Oh, okay. You can just it. collect marijuana, just conduct study. To be specific on what study uh, you're creating, on what study you want to prove or want to see the compounds that are active within marijuana for that particular study. So I think it depends on the study in which we select plants. First, you go for literature and then consult with traditional healers to prove and then go to the lab to prove that specific or you want to find a specific compound that is active towards that activity or something you're testing on. So I think it depends on that. On different diseases, Nazi is doing diabetes, war is HIV, um, uh, cancer and HIV. I'm focusing on skin. I'll come back. So, okay. these are available everywhere in South Africa. Yeah, these are indigenous plants, yeah. South African indigenous plants. Yeah, so the other, the other aim for our study is to make the medicine easily accessible. As you know, the plants are easily accessible to the local communities. So if we know and we've proven that the plants, the system plant is active towards, let's say, diabetes, we can go to the community and teach them through councillors. We can meet with councillors and traditional uh, leaders and go to the communities and teach people about that system plant because it's easily accessible aside from just buying medicine to treat cancer. We know that can be expensive and especially for people coming from uh, rural players, so they have to go far to just to get medicine. So if they know that certain plant is available in the specific area, they can just go to the place and be able to use the medicine of the plant. Thank you so much, lady and gentlemen. I'll come back for my stuff. <laughs>